Well, hi there. Have you ever considered keeping spectacular giant moths as pets? I hadn't. That is until I went to Matt Jepson's house for the very first time and saw what he had in his refrigerator. Because, oh my gosh, will you look at what he had in his refrigerator? These moths are spectacular. And so I had to have Matt come over here and show these off and help me and maybe you decide if these moths are good pets and if they're the best pet insects for you. Which would be pretty crazy given that many of them don't have functional mouth parts. I'll explain that in a moment. But first, we're gonna have to rank the giant silk moth based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the giant silk moth a score of three out of five. These moths are really pretty easy to handle. There are, however, a couple of concerns. First, they can fly. So if they're warm enough, uh, having them fly off might be a concern. That said, those species that are nocturnal, which is most of them, are very vulnerable to bird predators, and thus they are very unlikely to take off and fly during the day. Second problem is that they can be damaged. Their wings, like the wings of all Lepidopteran insects, are fragile and covered in tiny scales that can easily come off. So you probably want to keep handling to a minimum, probably just when moving them from one container to another, or when you want to take pictures of them because Let's be honest, you don't get a pet that lives for a week as your companion animal. Your pictures will last much longer than will your moths. As juveniles, other than being small and squishable, they're very easy to handle. They have no wings, so they don't have the same issues as the adults. They may nibble on you a bit, uh, they do have functional mouth parts, and eating is their only mission in life, but that's pretty uncommon. Overall, it's really easy. Maybe not that fun, though. When it comes to care, we give the giant silk moth a score of four out of five. But I actually want to turn over the time to Matt because I've never kept giant moths and he does this like as a lifestyle. Well, it's good to be back, Clint. <laughs> good and to it's... have you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, excited to talk about probably the nerdiest part of my life. Oh, um, don't, 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 don't try to kid us. <laughs> At least my wife constantly reminds me that this is the nerdiest part of my life. Um, but I do have a lot of Yo, What are the things that rival it? <laughs> well, we have reptiles, amphibians, yeah. gardening yes. of all sorts. I mean, it's like my backyard is a jungle. You know? um, fishing nonstop. Yeah, and then stuff I'm not gonna say on here. <laughs> 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 all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just let your imaginations run wild. Take me through all of the life cycles of a giant silk moth and, and what I need to do at each stage. So I, I, let's start at the very beginning because that's a, a very good place to start. How do I get eggs? So there's, there's two primary ways that we get the eggs, right? One way is that we'll go out at night, we'll use a black light or a mercury vapor light, and we'll put up a sheet and go into a very mothy place. It's not a word. Yes, it is. But uh, we'll set that up and we'll wait. And moths will come in. Lots of times it's, it's heavy males, but you'll get, every once in a while you'll get a female that will come in, sit on that, uh, on that sheet and we'll collect the female and put her in something where she can lay her eggs. We'll take a female, you'll put her in a cooler like this. Uh, and this cooler will damage her wings less. Yeah, smooth-sided thing. Sometimes people just use a paper bag, but this works really well. Put them in there and she'll start laying her eggs. Um, that's They're just hardwired to, to get those eggs out. And um, there are a few species that need a food plant to trigger it, but most of them will just start laying eggs in rows inside of the, the styrofoam cooler. That's awesome. Okay, and so you said there was another way I can get eggs. So the other way to obtain eggs is just to purchase them or trade them or, or have someone give you some that is raising them themselves. You go to like a dark alley somewhere and you're like, hey, man. Yeah. One, we'll one cut some eggs. Shake the eggs, yep. I like it. Okay, and then once once you have the eggs, uh, I assume you just leave them in that cup until they hatch. Then what? 
Yeah, so you don't put any food plant in the cup with unhatched eggs. They, okay. It uh, can keep them from hatching. And then once they hatch, you can either start them in something as small as that same deli cup, or you can start them in uh, you know, Tupperware size thing like this. Fill it with food plant and the caterpillars start munching on it. And if you're raising them in this tub method, and there's different ways to raise them, but if you're using this method, then you just need to every few days change out the, the plants, keep the, uh, the food plant fresh, and clean out the frass, the droppings that are in there. And you said the, the type of plant, a lot of times a, a given species can accept a, a number of different food plants, but they are there's just a, a specific range of plants that each one will take. So you gotta know what species of moth yeah. you have yeah, you need and to, what food plants you can get in your area. That's exactly right. Yeah, you need to know which species of uh, uh, plants, but most species do take a fair variety of species of tree and sometimes plants. Okay, and then, and then so, so those are gonna just grow, 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 and then they're gonna pupate. Uh, and once they're a pupa, which is like a cocoon, what do you do with those? So when they, when they pupate, it depends on the species and the time of year. So some species, like this cocoon here, is a glover silk moth related to the cecropia moth that most people in the eastern part of the country we would be more familiar with. These are hardwired to overwinter. They will diapause and they will not emerge until the following year. So you're done. You put them in the fridge to trigger that process. And that's, they need that cooling just like seeds would need that to, uh, to germinate the next spring. And, and you, you wait for them to hatch or to, you wait for them to eclose or emerge. Others have multiple generations in a season. This papery cocoon is a luna moth cocoon, and they can have three or even four generations in the deep south, even though in the north they may only have one or two. It's all determined by, by light. And for these that are going to have another generation, they need to be placed in a, a screen cage where when they emerge in 10 to 20 days, they have something to climb up onto and pump their wings. It's critical they have somewhere to hang and be able to pump those wings full and then they will be ready to mate or to release. That is so cool. Okay, so then once they're that once they've emerged from the cocoon, you've got adults. Now they have no mouth parts. So right. feeding is over. Yeah, so the, for the silk moss, some of the sphingids will feed, but for the silk moss, they have one thing on their mind, <laughs> and that is to breed. The females will cl climb up on a plant or a branch and they will wait for nightfall and they'll send out their pheromones. The males wait for nightfall and then they go in search of females. And uh, when they find them, they'll, they'll breed. Typically, they'll breed through the next day and then the males will go look for more females as long as they have strength uh, until the, the week or two that they just run out and their wings are tattered and they're, they're just done. Whereas the females, after they breed, they're only interested in laying eggs and they'll just fly until their abdomen is empty and they've put eggs on trees all in the area they're in. That is yeah. so cool. That is so cool. Well, that actually seems pretty reasonable, like not, not insane care, but I'm really glad you were here to teach us because what a, what a cool nerdy hobby you have. <laughs> I'd like to take just a moment to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon. As we've been making this video, it has become apparent to me that this is a rad hobby. And I really want to go along with Matt and see how all of this works. But we're gonna need obviously some special equipment to do this and to film this and to show this to all of you guys. And it is our patrons at Patreon that have always made these kinds of jumps in our abilities to share these animals with you possible. And, and to try to pay you back, we've got a host of really cool features. So, you know, if you're interested in helping us continue to increase our capabilities as a channel and just support what we're doing and also get those cool features, check us out on Patreon. When it comes to hardiness, we give the giant silk moth a score of three out of five. I had a really hard time deciding what to say here. These don't live very long as adults. And by not very long, I mean much less than a month in most cases, sometimes like a week. That said, you know, it's not because they aren't hardy. Many are very hardy, though, uh, you know, a few species are not. And it isn't really even that they don't live very long. It's just that they spend most of their lives as larvae and pupae, 
Because moths are part of a group of insects called the holometabolous insects. And holometabolous insects are the most successful group of animals, at least by species number of any group on the planet. And the big benefit that they have over the hemimetabolous insects, and uh, indeed almost any other group on the planet, is that their babies, the larvae, are almost nothing like the adults. The larvae are caterpillars, so we just discussed. And the caterpillars, uh, given the right food, should be pretty hardy. The reason it's so beneficial for the larvae to be different from the adults is because you don't compete with any species more directly for resources than you do your own species. And in general, adults outcompete juveniles unless adults are totally different and don't use the same resources at all. Juvenile moths generally eat leaves, as we just discussed. Adults eat nectar if they eat anything at all. And like I said, most of these moths do not even have functional mouth parts as adults. Much like the larvae have one mission, to eat, these also have only one mission, to make more larvae. In between, you have the pupa stage, and that doesn't eat or reproduce, it just has one job as well, to transition. The whole cycle can last as long as a year, sometimes even longer. So they aren't really a super short-lived insect, but once it's a moth, you have just about reached the end of the road. And that's what makes the end of a bug's life so bittersweet. Yeah? When it comes to availability, we give the giant silk moth a score of 3 out of 5. So here's the deal. You can get these online as long as the season is right. If you do get them that way, just make sure you follow your local and federal laws. You can get eggs, you can get caterpillars, and you can get pupae. If you get moths, they're probably going to come in a glass case. Depending on where you live, you may be able to collect your own caterpillars, and that can be pretty cool too. You're not going to see them usually at pet stores or at, at expos, because the timing is just too important. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the giant silk moth a score of 5 out of 5. If you find them yourself, they're free. But the larvae can be pretty reasonable as well. Host plants may cost a bit, depending on where you are and how difficult it is to find, but they also might be free in your yard. You'll need a rearing box or a series of rearing boxes and some space in your refrigerator, and that's about it. This is why overall we give the giant silk moth a score of 3.6 out of 5. If what you want is a little caterpillar that you can keep in the fridge for a while when it pupates and then see something amazing right before the end, then the giant silk moth might be the perfect pet insect for you. As always, like and subscribe. Be sure to check out Matt's unreal Facebook page, which has pictures of all of the crazy... He goes all over the world and photographs amazing animals. Obviously, he breeds crazy silk moths and basilisks and rosy boas. He is just, he's an awesome guy. Follow him on Facebook. We'll have a link down in the description. And we hope to see you real soon. Don't try to kid us. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. I told there you they go. fly <laughs> to the light. <laughs> he likes that light. There we go. I'm all over this Come like on, stink kind of monkey. What? What did you say? <laughs> I said I'm all over this like stink kind of monkey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Okay, he says. <laughs> Whatever, however you want to describe it. Um, <laughs> so 